Good Monday morning of Holy Week. This is the great week of the year for the faith. This is, there's no way around it. You can make a, you know, you could think of Christmas as it, and of course with the great preparation and its celebratory element. But this is the week in which our faith is established and expressed. This is the week that gives us hope because it's the week in which Christ transforms life, death into life. He overcomes all the evils of the world in his own body through the crucifixion. It's, and he doesn't, he, really I want to show you this because we're going to read Isaiah uh, this morning. And okay, the, the image of the suffering, the suffering, the Lamb of God. Christ doesn't conquer evil through force. He does it through love. I guess that's what I want to say here. The world screams out, for, the, it's screaming out for wholeness, and it'll never get it by violent and force, but only through the tenderness of love. And that's the image of the suffering servant. That's the word I wanted to say. Christ is the suffering servant. And in his weakness, he's more powerful than power itself. He transforms the world. What's with this Isaiah? Isaiah's a consummate genius here. He <laughs> got a... Well, Isaiah is not what only, he's as much talking about the suffering of, the, of his own people as he is of the Savior. Okay, what was he thinking? I don't know. I know what he says. And so what he says, here is my servant whom I uphold. Famous lines. My chosen one with whom I am pleased. Upon whom I have put my spirit. He shall bring forth justice to the nations. Even if he's talking about it, which he is, he doesn't have Christ clearly in mind. He's thinking of his own people, and they are going to be the salvation of humankind. As a Christian, we see it all comes together in Christ himself. He's going to see the suffering of his people. We see the suffering of Christ. And in that, it transforms the suffering of the Jews into a sacrament of life. You see, it's not taken away from Isaiah. It's fulfilling Isaiah. Here's what he says. Boy, it's a great portraiture of the suffering servant. Watch what he says. They're famous. These, these, were, these lines are as famous as Christianity itself. Not crying out, not shouting, not making his voice heard in the street. This, I think, is the most wonderful line in, in the Old Testament. I, I mean this. I, you want an image of God, this is you're getting it with a vengeance here. Rather than a fearful... A tempestuous deity, a clap of thunder and I, you know, a stroke of lightning. Listen to the image he gives here. A, 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 not crying out, not shouting, not making his voice heard in the street. This is the great line. A bruised reed he shall not break, and a smoldering wick he shall not quench. Think of God's relationship to us who are sinful, who are bruised reeds he shall not break. And a smoldering wick, barely alive, would fire. He won't quench. Okay. A smoldering wick, he shall not quench. Until he establishes justice on the earth, the coastlands will wait for his teaching. Thus says God the Lord. Now listen to contrast. Uh, he is, he is, uh, how can I put it right? A bru not crying, not making a voice heard, in a, a bruised reed he shall not break, a smoldering wick he shall not quench. And who is this? This is God. Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spreads out the earth with its crops, who gives breath to his people and spirit to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you for the victory of justice. I have grasped you by the hand. Notice how he is starting. He brings about justice through the intimacy of love. And it's a parental love. It's a father holding the hand of a child. See? You've all done that. When you're in a tricky situation, you've got your children, you say, hold my hand. I'm going to cross the street, hold my hand. Huh? See? Okay. See that? I, the Lord, have called you for the victory of justice. I grasped you by the hand. I formed you and set you as a covenant of the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes of the blind, to bring out prisons from confinement, and from the dungeon those who live in darkness. And I have come to free you from the darkness of ignorance, you see, the blindness of sin. Christ is, Christ is for the Jews, but culminating in Christ 
is the wisdom of God in the flesh, a wisdom that brings life and light, a life and light that is not defeated by the darkness of ignorance or the finitude of life itself. We're not defeated either by ignorance or death. And why is that? Because Christ, the wisdom of God, is incarnate and incarnate on the cross. That's the genius of this text in Isaiah. I love this text, and I gotta say, I'm not speaking well this morning, I'm sorry about that. But it's a, it's a beautiful text because you feel the gentle hand of God in guiding us to life and wisdom, a final rectitude in all things, a final justice. Not justice in a court of law, but justice in the rectitude of existence itself. Making whole what is fractured, making light what is dark, what is dying, give it life. The triumph of life and wisdom and light over death and ignorance. It's a wisdom that is transformative. Life over death. Wisdom over his foolishness. Hope over despair. Eternity over time without eliminating time transforms time so that nothing is lost that can be saved. That's the hope we have in the, the great Easter mystery in Christ, the incarnation, thank you, Christmas Day, but especially in the suffering servant who shares our suffering and who redeems us by his gentleness, his gentleness on the cross. He doesn't fight the cross. He doesn't rebel against it. Rather, he transforms the cross into life. He is the suffering servant, not crying out. He doesn't cry out, nor does he shout, okay? Nor is he making himself known on the street, as it were. He himself, in his suffering, he will not, he will not break a bruised reed, and a smoldering wick he shall not quench. As whom? The suffering servant won't. You'll say that. I think of the image of Christ on the cross in John's Gospel. In his death, he redeems just two things. He redeems the, the centurion standing in front of him, the man who kills him. He redeems him. And man comes to believe when he sees the water and the blood come from Christ's side. In the death of Christ, he becomes a believer. The centurion, he represents the nations of the world. Meanwhile, at the foot of the cross is Mary, Mary's sister, and John. The Jewish, the entire Judaic tradition in the flesh is in Mary. See? And John is the genius to put it all together in his gospel. He sees the reality of the birth of the church out of the side of Christ. See? Not of a man of power, when no, she was surrounded by a world of power, the Caesars, but as a suffering servant and who redeems by not breaking the bruised reed or quenching that little flicker of fire who brings life out of death, hope out of despair, wisdom out of foolishness. That's the truth. Isaiah is a genius. He is an absolute religious genius. I think of those terms as the capacity to grasp the, the, the unfathomable, but yet put it into words in such a way that our religious imagination can kick off. It's not a set of philosophical proposition, propositions. It's an imaginative narrative in which he captures the, the, the great mystery of who and what is Christ. That's Isaiah, but it's also the Gospels. I think especially John. I love St. John's Gospel because it's such a profound wisdom, as is Isaiah and the prophets, but Isaiah is a consummate genius. Isaiah, in, in recognizing the suffering of his people as redemptive for all, not only themselves, but for the nations, he foresees, without even knowing it, the suffering of Christ the ultimate Lamb of God, who doesn't cry out but dies silently on the cross. That's the truth. It's the, to me, I guess the combination to me is of Isaiah and John. You, you want to understand the suffering servant, read the chapters on, read the, the passion account of John and the suffering servant of Christ, who is Christ on the cross, not crying out, but giving birth to the church through his death.